All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly Episode 91, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And uh, yeah, apologies for missing the previous episode. One of my cats was sick. Uh, if you don't follow me on Twitter, you probably haven't seen that. But yeah, I had to take her to the vet instead of streaming. Uh, she's all better now, so we can get back to JavaScript news, basically. We do have a, a ton of libraries and demos this week around, but not so much everything else. So I guess let's just uh, get right into it and see what we have to talk about today. Um, hey, not a number is a number. Welcome to the stream. Good to see you as well. It's been, it feels like I haven't streamed for like ages, but you know, it's only been like two weeks, I think. <laughs> it's weird. All right, as usual, the first uh, section is getting started, bringing you all the article that can get you started in different stuff. The first article of the day is cropping images to a specific aspect ratio with JavaScript. A pretty nice tutorial that guides you through, well, cropping images, right? So if you are working with images and if you are wondering how exactly do you crop it to a specific aspect ratio, which, well, basically comes down to the math, to be honest, uh, it also acts as a nice tutorial for the canvas. So if you're interested in that, do check it out. Other than that, you know, it's uh, very straightforward. There is nothing super complicated here, but it's a nice little tutorial. All right, next thing we got here is building animated draggable interfaces with Vue.js and Tailwind. It's a pretty nice tutorial on uh, building, well, as it says, the draggable list in this case with uh, Vue.js and Tailwind. Um, I, yeah, I don't really have much more to say about that. As you know, I pretty much love Tailwind. Uh, I've been using it since I basically discovered it. It's an amazing CSS framework. Vue.js is also a very nice library and I've used it in more than one project. And well, this guides you through basically using the view draggable to create a nice drag and drop list that looks relatively fancy with um, Tailwind. But yeah, if, if that sounds interesting to you, do check it out. It's not... You know, it's not nothing super advanced in here, but it's a nice little tutorial. All right, next thing we got here is getting started with an express in ES6 plus JavaScript stack. Uh, so this is very large, as you can see here in the scroll size is like immensely big article that guides you through building your own CRUD application using um, modern ES6. So, you know, all the modern features that are now supported out of the box in Node.js, including Node modules and stuff like this. And then uh, attaching it uh, to the MongoDB with Express Server and exposing the REST API for that. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It also does a pretty good job of basically introducing you to ES6 features such as the structuring, shorthands, a sync await, spread operator, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it actually starts with uh, just purely ES6 features and then goes into Express and only then, or I think the other way around, actually first MongoDB and then Express. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's a pretty nice detailed tutorial. All right, next thing we got here is JavaScript visualized event loop. A pretty nice, I mean, it's short-ish article, but it's very nice, uh, nicely visualized, let's put it this way. So it basically shows you a set of uh, GIFs animated or videos, I don't know, whatever their format is, I guess GIFs in this case, that uh, show you um, uh, how the uh, JavaScript uh, event loop works step by step, which is sometimes like it's, you know, it's one of those concepts that you have to really understand to work efficiently with JavaScript, but it can take a few uh, years, I guess. <laughs> to properly click with you because, you know, it seems like a relatively straightforward concept, but sometimes it just doesn't kind of click in your brain and you just struggle with it. And sometimes the gifts like this can help you a lot in understanding how exactly it works. So if you still struggle with the concept of event loop, if you still don't kind of understand completely how it works, do make sure to look through this article, look at the gifts, look at the description. Maybe this will help you uh, finally figure it out, basically. It's a pretty good visualization. I still think that the best one was that uh, interactive one where you could actually click and see it step by step. We covered it in one of the previous podcasts, I think all the way in the beginning, actually, because it was a few years ago. Uh, but yeah, anyway, that's a pretty good one. So do check it out. All right. Next thing we got here is NSQ tutorial, build a simple message queue using NSQ. So this is essentially a tutorial for NSQ and using it from Node.js. Uh, NSQ is apparently a new distributed messaging platform that is written in Golang and uh, developed by the guys from Bitly. 
So if you are interested in message queues and if you wanted to try something else than Rabbit or ZeroMQ or whatever, then this seems like a pretty nice alternative. So you can, you know, it's it's written in Golang. So basically it means it's cross-platform. You can run it just about anywhere. Seems to be relatively easy to work with. Uh, has a nice Node.js API and, you know, all the message queue related stuff, consumers, uh, producers, queues, all that kind of stuff is included, obviously. So if you're working with those, do check it out. Maybe you will find that interesting. And the last article we got here for today in the getting started section is experimental react using suspense for data fetching. So this is a nice write up on, um, well, suspense for data fetching. So specific look at the application of suspense in the react experimental build to the data fetching. So if you were, you know, I mean, we've, we've had suspense for rendering for quite some time and it's, I think it's even live now, right? So I don't, I don't think I've actually ever used it until now, but yeah, it's been out there for quite some time. Now suspense for data fetching is something that's still experimental and something that uh, is only be, that's something you, you can only work with if you get the experimental build of React. And it's still confusing, like, you know, at least to me, I haven't tried it yet. So I still find it a bit confusing with the whole like throwing promises and everything. But at some point I got to dive into it and see, and this article walks you through it quite nicely. So basically it shows you what you have to do to set it up, how it works, uh, what you have to do to actually uh, return the uh, pending statuses, errors and responses and stuff like this. So if you are curious, do check it out. It's a pretty good write up. All right. That is it for the getting started section. Now we have two articles here today. Just two is uh, both are actually quite cool. So the first one is from Cloudflare guys and it's titled the languages, which almost became CSS. Now, first of all, this is not exactly JavaScript, but I just found this article to be absolutely fascinating. So I wanted to share with you guys. This is a write up on essentially history of CSS and uh, what kind of other languages could have been CSS and what kind of proposals were there in the very beginning when the Mosaic browser just, you know, was just in development, basically not even reached 1.0. Oh, um, there is some weird syntax over here. Like this is, this is one of the examples. So add body for F A equals H E S I equals 18. Like how, what the hell does this even mean? Apparently this is actually FA is a font family for whatever reason, HE is Helvetica and SI is a font size. It's like, I'm really happy to see that we didn't, you know, this proposal didn't stick and we actually get a proper CSS because this just looks bonkers. It's not easy to read. And there is a lot more here. So like the author here goes through the, all the previous proposals, which is absolutely fascinating to see some of those things are, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's, <laughs> it's really hard to read. Um, and yes, they make current CSS look a lot nicer than, you know, you would think it is, uh, because the older proposals are just complete bonk. It's like, there's even like closure or lisp style stuff here that I guess it's not terrible, but it's just weird. <laughs> So there you go. If you have any interest in CSS history or just, you know, development, web development history in general, I would recommend reading that because it's absolutely fascinating and there's some really cool stuff in here. Okay. Next thing we got here is uh, the pretty cool study from the backlink, uh, backlinko.com. Uh, so the article is titled, we analyzed 2.5 million desktop and mobile pages. Here's what we learned about page speed. It's a pretty in-depth analysis of, um, well, the pages and the things that affect the loading and display speed, time to first byte, time to first render and all that kind of stuff on a pretty large scale, like 2.5 million um, entries is a lot, right? So if you are curious, I would highly suggest reading into it. There is some very interesting things here like, um, one of the things that I found here, so they compare the CMS by page speed performance, right? And they have this like, so most of those are fast, some of them are average, and then some of them are slow. And I feel like a lot of people are gonna read that as, hey, the Joomla and I don't know, WordPress are actually slow. And that's kind of true, but it's also not because you can be fast with them. It just takes more effort, it seems, right? It's also interesting to see stuff like uh, if we take the impacts of things on uh, time to first byte, 
then on desktop, the content delivery network has the most impact, while on mobile, it's actually only third, which is very curious. So there's some very interesting uh, data in here. Uh, again, you know, if you're interested, do have a read through. There's some interesting uh, stuff. And uh, there is a, t so like actually the article is not that big itself, right? Like it's big, but not super big. And then uh, about, I don't know, what is it? Three fourths of rest of the page is just comments of people <laughs> discussing this stuff. There's also some very interesting stuff in discussion. So make sure to go through that at least a bit. Um, so yeah, there you go. Right, uh, that is it for articles and news. Now we got a few tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. And uh, the first one of them is this uh, thread from, or I guess post from Rich Harris the one of the authors of Svelte uh, that talks about web components. Apparently web components break uh, accessibility, they break progressive enhancement, meaning you don't get any server side rendering. And it, they are basically broken without JavaScript, they don't work with SVGs, and they share global namespace instead of being modular. So this is just like the four highlights that he put here in a tweet, and that's three dots, meaning there's more caveats. And he says, imagine how much tedious moralizing we'd see if JavaScript frame frameworks shipped with similar limitations. And he's absolutely right. You take any popular JavaScript framework for UI we have today, be it React, Vue, Svelte, I don't know, Angular, whatever you can imagine, right? All of them have these features while web components don't. And we still have people in the community who try to push web components, which, I mean, I guess, you know, it's, it's great. The idea that we have something native that can replace framework is awesome but they are not even close to being at stage where you could take web components and then replace any existing frameworks with just web components, which is uh, kind of bonkers when you think about it. But there you go, it's just sort of a PSA, I guess, for you if you were considering using web components. So uh, yeah, the next tiny thing is, uh, as you know, the ES modules are now natively supported in Node.js and uh, jQuery just migrated from using AMD to just using ECMAScript modules, which is kind of great. So yes, jQuery is still actively maintained. It's still a totally viable um, library. And as you can see your migration actually, uh, you know, is pretty damn big to be honest. It's like 800 additions and more than 1,300 deletions, which is uh, pretty damn impressive. So there you go, if you wanted to use jQuery as an ES module, you now can. Okay, and the last thing we got here is a new RFC for Next.js static generation that adds build time data fetching, client side routing with build time data and static and server rendered pages in one application as well as static generation for routes coming from a CMS. Now, what this essentially means is this, this turns Next.js into sort of a hybrid between Gatsby and well, the old Next.js. The idea is that you now have, or will have uh, additional methods that you can define on components, right? Like get static props, get server props, that will, for example, the get static props will be generated on the build time. So if you have any data fetching in there, it's gonna be executed build time and then just statically bundled together into component and rendered immediately, which is exactly how Gatsby works right now, right? So you got this all the pre-processing thing that's basically fetches the data, throws it into Gatsby backend, and then Gatsby statically compiles them into pages and you're done. This is what's gonna happen here, which makes Next.js incredibly powerful in my opinion. And um, yeah, it's actually, I'm not even sure I would need Gatsby after that. I mean, Gatsby has some still some, you know, ad additional bonus things like GraphQL unified interface and things like this. But with this changes, Next.js might be very, like a lot more interesting, I guess. Let's just put it this way. A lot more universal. Let's just put it this way. So yes, if you're curious about the proposal, uh, make sure to read through the RFC itself. There's some interesting things. It looks really neat. So I'm, I can't wait to see this shipped basically. Right, uh, so we don't really have any releases this week around for whatever reason. So there's literally nothing, no new versions that are you know notable and uh, worth highlighting. So let's just go into the libraries and demos. And yes, we do have a ton of those this week around for some reason. So I guess people decided just to release or highlight their um, demos instead of releasing new versions. Okay, so the first thing we got here 
is uh, CoCatiel. It's a resilient and transient fault handling library. Uh, sorry, resilience and transient fault handling library that allows developers to express policies such as back off, retry, circuit breaker, timeouts, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so if you ever work with .NET, they have a poly library that is super handy for it, which basically does exactly this. And it actually looks really nice. So basically the idea is that you can uh, use uh, CoCatiel's um, policy um, class, I guess, right, to define the policies that says, okay, so we are going to handle everything, we're going to retry three times, and we're going to exponentially increase the time between retries, right? exponential back off, right. And uh, you can combine policies into one policy from two different ones. So in this case, for example, an example, uh, the author combines the retry policy with a circuit breaker. And then you just wrap whatever you want to execute in this uh, policy. And you're done, which looks incredibly clean and uh, could be very, very nice. It also supports cancellation tokens. So you can actually cancel stuff if you want to, which is great. So, you know, if you're working a lot with uh, things that require back off, retries, circuit breakers, timeouts and stuff like this, absolutely check this out. It actually looks pretty damn good. Next thing we got here is Decaffeinate. So this one has been around apparently for quite some time, but I never seen it. So I thought I would just highlight it. It's um, a compiler from CoffeeScript back to Java, modern, modern JavaScript, right? So if you have an old CoffeeScript code base and you want to convert it back into the modern JavaScript, because, you know, I, I don't think, does anyone still use CoffeeScript? That's a good question. You can actually just uh, take this tool, run it over your CoffeeScript code base, and it will just work. For example, they did it for Atom code base, and it worked perfectly fine, which is actually damn impressive. So there you go. Um, right. Next thing we got here is uh, Autarky. Autarky. I'm not sure how to read that. Autarky. Autarky. Um, it's uh, yet another tool that helps you to get rid of node module folders. In this case, it basically it's a bit more advanced. It actually allows you to uh, filter by node modules folders and delete them by the um, installation or creation time, I guess, of the folders. You can get rid of the old unused node modules from the older projects that you never used or you, know, you haven't used in the last year or whatever. I personally have a ton of those. And yes, it's sometimes very handy to have something like this. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. Next thing we got here is scroll trigger essentially the uh, yeah, scroll interaction library that allows you to define triggers that would work on specific scrolling points. That you know, as a simple object uh, definition API, and then you can create a bunch of triggers or remove them. And it seems to work relatively well. So you can do stuff like this here, appearing elements, disappearing elements, some fancy background stuff, and is just you know, plain JavaScript without any plugins or jQuery or anything like this, if I remember correctly. Seems nice. So if you're working with scroll lots, do check it out. This seems like a pretty nice library. Okay, next thing we got here is creepy face. This is probably my favorite one. It's a JavaScript library that makes your face look at the pointer. Uh, as the author says, ideal for resumes or team websites. So it literally makes the um, faces on the page follow the pointer. And I absolutely love this cat in the middle. And if you pointed it, there'll be a hand and the cat is gonna be like, no. So this is just perfect. And um, I think every website should have a cat that watches over your point. Okay, anyway, uh, yes, if you if you want that, check it out. I mean, keep in mind that obviously this is made with images, right? So essentially just um, scrolls through images that points towards your pointer, which means that there is significant data overhead, meaning you have to have like, that is a lot of images. So like, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, like, I don't know, 12 images or something, right? For the all the directions essentially. So yeah, that's not without downsides, but it's a really neat library anyway, so do check it out. Okay, next thing we got here is Kilonio, or uh, yeah, I guess Kilonio. Again, some of those names, I have no idea how to read it, but there we go. So it's a performance testing library for Node.js written in TypeScript. Essentially allows you to run uh, performance tests uh, by, you know, automating all sort of the things that you typically have to do, like run, run 100 times, measure deviation, print you all the mean, the deviation and stuff like this. So if that sounds interesting, if you do a lot of performance uh, testing, this is probably exactly what you want. The neat thing, it seems to have integrations with Jest and Mocha, so you can actually have uh, the like complete 
output with uh, deviations per test and stuff like this. Uh, so, you know, if you are working a lot with this, if you have a very strict restrictions uh, with regards to uh, performance and you have to do it within your test suits, do check it out. This actually seems to be quite handy. Right, next thing we got here is Mind.js, yet another voxel engine built in JavaScript that is kind of like Minecraft, but you know, in this case, this is not, the full game is just a voxel engine. So if you ever wondered how do you build your own voxel engine, then well, there you go. It's actually a really nice uh, code base. You can learn from it. It's built using 3.js and uh, React.js for the UI. Uh, so yeah, pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, continuing, we got Beam, an expressive WebGL. So this is a web, like library for working with WebGL, but expressively, as it says. It has a very nice uh, API and it allows you to do, well, a ton of things actually. Where is, so you can even like um, do the texture configurations, like allows you to do all of that in the demos, at least in, real time with, you know, with all that stuff is all of that is WebGL looks really nice. And yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not a WebGL person, but even for me, the API looked really clean. So do check it out if you work a lot with WebGL, maybe this will simplify your life. All right, next thing we got here is Hexabit, a music sequencer using commits. Um, yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's one of those silly ones, but it's pretty neat. So essentially, yes, you can, uh, can just uh, pick a um, set of instruments you want. I failed to fetch because my JavaScript is blocked likely, right? So you just uh, pick a set of instruments, then you pick a repository and then you can just say, okay, yeah, you know what? So it's just gonna be like, hey, we got this thing. And then you got Redux.js with commits and you can pick the, yeah, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous, but it's so well made, it's just crazy. So uh, yeah, if I guess if you ever wanted to make music from your commits, now you can uh, like live, or if you wanted to learn how to do sequencing online with the web audio API, there you go, you can do that too. It's, it's actually pretty good. <laughs> okay, continuing, we got NTL, node task list, interactive CLI to list and run package JSON scripts. So if you ever were too lazy to look into package JSON and you never remember what kind of scripts does it has, they can just use the NTL package that will uh, interactively show you what scripts do you have there and allow you to pick which one do you want to run, including descriptions, commands, and all that kind of stuff. Also can run scripts in parallel and provide environments and do things like this. So, you know, if you're uh, doing a lot of that, do check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. Nothing, you know, super complicated here, but it looks quite nice. Okay. Next thing we got here is Particles BG, React Particles Animation Background Components. Um, that is not gonna work here because UMatrix for some reason is not very good friends with Staglitz. But if I open it in an incognito window, that should be working just fine. So there we go. Uh, yeah, it just basically allows you to do random particles in the background that looks absolutely bonkers. I. <laughs> I mean, I guess you would probably could make it look nice, but the demos they have are kind of bonkers, but you know, as a learning material, I guess that's that's uh, fine. So if you are working, yeah, I mean, this one looks probably okay, but it's still very, very distracting. <laughs> anyway, if you wanted the background particles component, do check it out, it uh, seems to be pretty nice. Next thing we got here is Legra.js. Um, so this is a Lego brick graphics, uh, three, 3.3 kilobyte gzipped JavaScript library that basically allows you to draw things using Lego brick shapes on canvas. You can even do animations with it, which is, um, there you go, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, if you ever wanted to draw things with Lego, there you go, now you can do that. I've, I don't know, I mean, I guess you could, I, I honestly don't know why would you want that, but it looks really cool anyway. <laughs> so do check it out if that sounds interesting. Okay, next thing we got here is Blocks UI Alpha, a JSX based page builder for creating beautiful websites. So um, yeah, it's a page builder, but it actually looks pretty damn cool. So you got this, you know, header and then you can just drag and drop modules and that, that, that is not what I wanted, so I trash this. Drag and drop modules and just basically edit them in line, right? And then you can export this as a uh, code, which you can then use 
in your Gatsby or React website or whatever, which to be honest is really damn awesome. So if you ever wanted a visual builder for stuff uh, in React, so obviously this is React based, so you know, caveat applies. It is actually really great and it's open source. You can, you know, if you want to, you can improve it, fork it, build it, whatever you want. It actually looks really impressive. So if you're working with React, I highly recommend it to at least look into it because it's quite damn neat. Okay. Next thing we got here is WRR, a tiny weighted round robin utility. So if you ever need to uh, distribute things in a round robin manner with weights, you no longer have to write it on your own. You can just take this tiny algorithm and well, yes, you know, it's super straightforward, super simple, super tiny. It's like 148 bytes. Uh, yeah, so if you ever were looking for something like this, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Flowy, a minimal JavaScript library to create flow charts. This one is super fancy. So it allows you to basically do this. You can drag and drop blocks, right? And then those blocks can connect. Now, the cool thing is that you can connect more than one block and then they will branch and then you can drag those branches around as well. And all of that works really well, really seamlessly, really easy with, you know, custom blocks and everything and is just damn fantastic. So if you were looking for a flow based things, do check like flow based library, I guess, flow charts. This one is really good. Um, caveats, it is based on jQuery. So you would have to either add jQuery to a project or, um, you know, if you're already using jQuery, then I guess this will just work out of the box. Nonetheless, it is amazingly well made and works very well. Okay, continuing, we got WebGL Studio JS. This is probably one of the most impressive ones this week. Uh, this is like a full on open source 3D graphics editor that is made in a browser. So it literally looks like a blender or something. Uh, I think it's still missing some features, so like physics, support for FBX and mesh editing. Um, but it's literally a full on 3D editor that works right in your browser with a scene, with cameras, with lights, with objects. You can import uh, files from your computer. You can even render stuff. You can do graphs for like uh, materials or whatever. And there's like GPU debugging and stuff. And it's just insane. Then you can even create your own shaders in here. And all of that is built in JavaScript. So there you go. If, if, you, if you for some reason wanted to work with 3D models in the browser or just wanted to investigate this field, this actually looks damn impressive. So uh, yeah, and uh, it's open source. So do check this one out. Right, uh, next thing we got here is uh, Senior Danta. Sign Denton, I don't know. So it's it's a modern library of public domain movies. Now this one's really neat. So it's, yeah, it's just as it says, it's basically a, uh, like IMDB, but for public domain movies, right? Essentially lists all the movies that are currently in public domains and you can just watch them right here. So you can just say, okay, hey, I wanna watch Buster Keaton and you just click a play button and it will load the video and you can just start watching it right here. And it's actually great. So if you ever wanted to do something with um, public domain movies or you just wanted to watch them or you wanna see how the UI is made, there you go, it's all on GitHub and you can just check it out. And um, yeah, uh, the data set is in JSON. So if you just want the data set, you can also grab it from the repo. So there we go. Okay, continuing, we got a desk filer, a safe and easy environment to publish JavaScript desktop apps, uh, everyday helpers and tools is what the title says. I tried to figure out what exactly it does, but it seems like it's sort of, um, so it's an Electron app, right? And it seems like the idea behind it is that instead of publishing your own Electron apps, you kind of bundle everything into one Electron app that sort of abstracts the publishing for you. And instead of building the whole app, you basically build tiny plugins that still have access to all the Electron parts. So kind of basically like a browser with plugins, but with access to the, uh, you know, system resources, which I guess could work, but um, you know, it just doesn't sound appealing to me. Maybe it is sounds interesting to you. So do check it out. It seems to be a pretty solid project. Uh, might be interesting. I mean, I don't know. Again, I don't see appeal for me personally, but you know, that's just my, my perspective on it. Okay, next thing we got here is LightGraph.js, a graph node engine and editor written in JavaScript, similar to PD or UDK blueprints. 
comes with its own editor and HTML5 2D canvas. So another graph editor that seems extremely similar to what you would see in uh, Unreal Engine, for example. And unfortunately, the demo website for some reason doesn't really work now. So the author, it just redirects to the author's uh, homepage. But uh, the repo is here. If you fork it or clone it and run it, it actually works perfectly fine locally. And it has some very fancy features here with the whole like knobs connections and stuff. So if you are looking for something like this, do check this one out. Right, next thing we got here is Quiet.js. This is uh, more on an experimental side of things. This is a tiny library that allows you to transmit data with sound using Web Audio API. Yes, you can basically encode data into sound and then transmit it and then receive it in some devices, some browsers using JavaScript. Um, that's basically all I have to know. It's very experimental. There's like basically doesn't support it. It's not supported on majority of things, at least the receiver. Transmitter is supported almost everywhere because, well, you can generate sound everywhere, but reading from the microphone apparently for some reason is not really working. I'm not sure why, but it's it's interesting. Um, oh yeah, it seems like so. So some of the uh, web audio implementation resembles stuff to 32 kilohertz, which basically limits audio range, right? Because this uh, library is using the ultrasound. So like I think, what was it, 19 kilohertz range, which means it's uh, basically imperceptible to people, right? But it can be perceptible by the microphones. But if you resemble it to 32 kilohertz, you lose that stuff. And um, yeah, so there you go. It's anyway, it's still, you know, curious thing and uh, an interesting experiment. So uh, there you go. If you're curious, do check it out. Okay. Next thing we got here is fix ES imports. Uh, so now that Node.js has ES imports enabled by default and you can just start using them, um, there's a caveat, right? So if you're using ES imports, you no longer can import from X or Y or Z. You actually have to give proper path. So it either has to be X.MJS or Y slash index.js if it's a folder or Z.JSON if it's a JSON file. And Refactoring your code base manually to do that is a bit of a pain in the ass. So an author here wrote a tiny tool that basically does this for you. It just resolves the common JS uh, files, you know, using the standard resolution uh, algorithm and then rewrites them to fit the new ES modules imports format. So have a code base that you want to migrate, do check this one out. It might save you some time. Right, next thing we got here is JS TLDR, a super nice catalog of JavaScript documentation, I guess, that has like arrays, functions, basically any default things you might want to look up here. So if you click on array, you can say, okay, I want array um, like splice or slice, right? This methods that nobody ever remembers. And you get a really nice summary that just says you, hey, this is the syntax, this is the examples, this is what it returns, this is basically all you want, and there's an MDN reference if that's not enough for you. Super convenient, super nice, so you know, if you needed a um, nice brief uh, reference thing, I guess, then there you go, this is what you were looking for. Okay, and the last thing we got in demos for today is feet on a floppy.website a pretty neat uh, tool that basically says, I mean, it's kind of approach slash tool, I guess, that says, hey, your website should actually be small enough to fit on a floppy disk, which is 1.44 megabytes. And we're gonna, you know, here's the tiny tool that will audit your website for that. So uh, let's, you know what, let's try bxjs.dev. I think, oh, uh, yes. Yes, there you go, have some JavaScript. Um, I actually think it won't fit, if it loads the web worker, it won't fit on the web. Uh, no, it does fit. Okay, so it doesn't load the web worker because the web worker brings our database in the background that uh, is used for searching, right? Which is quite a lot bigger than 1.4 megabytes. <laughs> but the website itself is just 64 or 66 kilobytes, which is perfectly fine and fits on one floppy, which is super handy. The cool thing is actually, I think it also gives you tips on how you can actually improve that. Um, yeah, so some tips on reducing page size. So there you go. And uh, yeah, it's a nice little tool. It also points to the stuff like Lighthouse, GD Metrics, WebHint, and all that kind of thing. So if you are, if you basically care about you know your website performance and your website uh, loading times, then do check this one out. It can help you quite a bit. Okay, uh, this is it for the libraries and demos. And the last thing I got here for today is. 
diff so fancy, a very fancy looking diffs uh, that you can use in any shell. Um, I mean, you know, there's a lot of those, but I just found it interesting that this, so the tool itself is actually written in Perl and shell script, right? Now, what I found interesting is that, okay, it looks quite nice and like has options and everything. The thing is you can actually install it uh, with, well, a lot of ways, including NPM, Nix, Brew, and packages on Arc Linux. The interesting thing is that the first one here comes NPM. So someone wrote a really nice package in Perl and then published it to NPM, which I mean, it's just, um, it's curious how NPM is now this universal command line tool installing platform, I guess. Okay, this is actually it from my side. So this was BXS Weekly episode 91. Uh, if you guys have any questions or suggestions or links I might've missed this week, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, we can just wrap it up here. Um, as usual, you can find all the links either on GitHub or on bxjs.dev. Uh, we have, uh, so I have a Twitter where I share some of the stuff I collect over the week. There is a Telegram channel where I basically collect all the links that I gather here for this. So if you want unfiltered stream of stuff that I find over the week, you can just subscribe to that channel. We have a Discord server where we talk about JavaScript. So if you need any help or you just want to discuss something, approaches, architectures, or you just, you know, want some basic help, join us. We're more than happy to talk. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. Okay. Doesn't seem like there's any more questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. I'm hoping we're not going to have any more breaks, uh, you know, since the cat is now better and I, you know, this doesn't seem to be anything in foreseeable future that would prevent me from streaming more. Uh, so yes, BXJS Weekly should be on schedule. There will not be any development streams anytime soon because I'm preparing a new course for the YouTube. Um, I'm hoping to finish it before the year end, but we're gonna see how that goes. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it from my side. So once again, thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support and I see you next time. Bye.